We welcome you to worship this morning. We're grateful that you have come to celebrate the communion service and worship this Sabbath morning. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that it is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and to have our bodies washed with pure water. is hymn number 109, Marvelous Grace. Please stand as you're here.
Let's bow our heads as we pray. Father, we come to celebrate the grace that you have given us through Jesus. We come to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for not only restoring us for eternity, but for giving us joy to live each day in the fullness of life that comes through Jesus. Bless us now as we worship. In Jesus' name, amen. more than two weeks uh, to recover. I came down with an illness uh, Christmas night, and uh, it wasn't until this week that I was completely uh, finished with uh, the difficulties. So well, let's remember our, many of our members who are not able to be with us. Uh, the same uh, time since Christmas, the Rembolts, uh, our organist Liz, uh, both have been very seriously ill, and in fact, Liz is not able to be with us today, only the second time in more than 28 years that she's missed a Sabbath. But we're happy to have Ray Egan filling in for us. So, Ray, thank you for being a minute man. <laughs> Take note of the announcements in your bulletin. Uh, next Sabbath is potluck, and so bring a generous amount of food so we can fellowship together. Take note of any of the other announcements there. A couple of new things coming up. Uh, on the 27th of January will be a family picnic right after church. So keep in mind, just two weeks away, January 27th, family picnic after church. And then a new item, encouraging people to come to church early, I mean to Sabbath school early, beginning February 3, there will be a continental breakfast served at 9 o'clock out front so you can fellowship together and and get to uh, be acquainted with each other and be here a little bit earlier. So keep that in mind, February 3. Today we want to honor a very special member of our church. I'd like to ask Anita Mackey to stand, please. Anita, on January 4, 1, celebrated her 104th birthday. You're like the ever ready buddy, you're going strong. And she, she reads Sabbath. So thank you, Anita, for the blessings that you bring us by inspiring us by your vibrant spirit and faithfulness. I was 
Now it's time for the children's story. While the two kids are coming down, I invite everyone to find someone to share the love with Jesus. Say welcome to our, our church today. Hug someone. Shake someone's hand. This is the family of God. Children, come on down. I got a special story for you. Good morning, boys and girls. Okay, let's try it again. Good morning, boys and girls. That's much better. Thank you. How are you guys doing today? Good. I'm awesome. That's awesome. That's great. Okay. Um, how many of you started school last week? Everybody's back at school already? No? Yeah, after the holiday, the Christmas holiday and New Year's and all that, it's time to go back to school, right? Yes, that's what we do best. We go back to school. We, we study. We get good grades, right? I want to tell you a little story about myself. When I was a little boy, right about your age, as far as I remember, my parents used to tell me, Friday is a day that we prepare for the Sabbath. So I clean my shoes, I prepare my clothes for the next morning, I got everything ready, mom was in the kitchen, uh, Cooking her, cooking the meal for Sabbath, for Friday night and for Sabbath and in all that preparation for Sabbath. Because I remember that Sabbath was the day that we went to church. I was so excited. And then came Friday morning, excuse me, Friday afternoon in the evening when the sun sets. That's when we, as a family, used to sit down on the, on, on, on the living room all together and we used to sing songs, um, and, and read the Bible and share stories and talk to each other as a family. Now, the part that I liked the most was that after we received the Sabbath and we prayed together and we sang together, we used to hold hands, all of us, all the family, and we would make one big circle holding hands and we would all say it together. Happy Sabbath. That was our thing. Well, guess what? That's something that I did when I was a kid and I was so excited that when I grew up and I got married and I had kids, I passed on that to them. Now, we at home, when we receive the Sabbath, we hold hands together and we all wish, we all say it together, Happy Sabbath, all together. And we're wishing each other Happy Sabbath. And that is a tradition that we made. What is tradition? Who knows what tradition is? Yes. We do it every week. You do it every week. Okay. Anybody else knows what tradition is? Something, something that is passed on like from generation to generation. Something that is passed on from generation to generation. Yes. Something that like if it's like Christmas or Halloween or something that you keep on doing and doing each year or each month or each week or something like that. Okay. That's a very good definition of tradition. Tradition is something that you do over and over again and you pass on to your children and your grandchildren and you keep passing on. Now, I have some other traditions that whenever I did something bad, my mom, my mom had the tradition to uh, pull up the belt and, and teach me uh, not to do it again. So tradition is something that you do it over and over again. Okay. Now, uh, the interesting thing is that we all have traditions. Now, what I want to tell you is that the Bible is full of traditions. The Bible is full of stories that we keep telling each other and we keep passing on to each other and to our children and to our, our grandchildren. 
And today, we have a tradition at church. Do you see something different here? Do you guys know what this is? Yes? This is a tradition. It's something that Jesus did, and he wants us to remember. Just like, just like my parents did it to me, every week we would hold hands and say, Happy Sabbath. I passed on that to my children. Chances are they're going to do with their, their children. And we pass on to generation to de from generation to generation. Now today, this is something that Jesus did when he was on earth. And he asked us to do it over and over again so we would remember something. And when, the more often you do it, the more you remember. Now, we have some other tradition here at church. That we started. Remember, in Christmas, we had the tradition, or we started a tradition of the uh, kids' Christmas party. Remember that? Yes? And we also have another tradition here at church for children. Did you guys know that every Wednesday, we come together as children and as a church, and we pray here at church? Yes, every Wednesday at 7 o'clock, we gather here. Do you guys like VBS, Vacation Bible School? It's awesome, isn't it? Well, it's very close to that, but it's every week. So if you guys have time to come to Koinonia Kids, it happens every Wednesday with activities, with songs, with, with games, with drawing, with art, every Wednesday. And I encourage you guys to come and be a part of that tradition. Do you guys remember that? Good. Now, I want to leave you with something. So you remember that here at Vallejo Drive, we have the opa. My my tradition is falling down here. Thank you. Now, you guys seen these little cups, right? That's what we use for our tradition. Now today, I want to give you each one of you one of these little cups. You're gonna take it home, and every time you look at it, you're gonna remember that we have a tradition that was given to us by Jesus. Would you remember that? Thank you so much. You may go to children's uh, worship right now on your way out. Come and grab one from me, okay? Thank you. Will the deacons come forward? And as the deacons are coming forward, our offering today is for developing ministries. Throughout the conference and the general conference, we have developing ministries. The offering today that you specify will be for that. But before they collect the offering, there is a slide that, is it gonna come up? Okay. There's a slide that shows what our budget was for 2017. We have an endowment that we receive 150,000 from. We rent our church, receive 12,000. We have money in a revolving fund that we get interest on. We get 12,850 uh, for that total. And then uh, each of us as individual has given offerings over the past 52 weeks, uh, average of about 8,414, and uh, we had a total of 612,379, a surplus. Remember the last time I was here, I talked about a bridge. The bridge was built, and we end up with a surplus. So we can say, praise God, for the blessings that he has given us. You know, I remember from a kid, I remember the story of Moses in the wilderness. He asked for stuff to build the temple and he had to tell them, stop bringing because there was too much. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for the abundant blessings that you have given us over the past year. Continue to bless us as we continue to worship you with our gifts, we ask in Jesus' name.
Good morning, church family. I'd like to invite those who are able to kneel as we come before our God in prayer. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning with grateful hearts for all that you have done for us. As we enjoy this beautiful Sabbath day that you've given us, we ask that your Holy Spirit would come here and fill this place with your presence. We ask that he would bring to our minds all that you have done for us, Father, that you are our creator. You are the God who has delivered us from bondage. You are the God who has redeemed us through the gift of your Son. And Father, as we celebrate the emblems of communion today, we ask that your spirit would, in a special way, revive within us this precious gift, that we would come into agreement with you that your ways are right, and we would allow you to heal us as you promised to do, if we come to you in faith. We want to lift up to you this morning, Father, all of the silent requests that are here in this congregation for, for healing, for, for finances, for um, loneliness, for depression. We just ask for your healing hand in these lives, that you would provide what we need. We ask that you would be with Pastor Mark as he brings us your word this morning. Open our hearts and our minds to your truth that we might become more like you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's scripture reading is found in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. We will be reading from the New King James Version. You may follow the reading on the screens. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and, it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Amen. A little more than a dozen years ago, when my grandson Hudson was about two years old, I took him over to Forest Lawn, Glendale. Taking him by the hand, we entered into the court of honor 
where the uh, Last Supper is displayed in stained glass windows. I know that many of you have been there. The tour guide was giving us a lecture in the entryway as we looked up at the mighty uh, statue of Moses uh, carved by Michelangelo. Hudson, Hudson listened with wide-eyed silence. He seemed to be taken by the grandeur and the awe of the setting. When we entered the hall where Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper with the state stained glass window was portrayed, he, I sat him on my lap and he put his head on my shoulder. I whispered in his ear the story about Jesus and the Last Supper. After the presentation was over, we viewed the statuary around the room. We stood just a few feet away from the Pieta, Michelangelo's work of Mary holding the crucified Jesus on her lap. I showed him the nail print so purely carved in the statue's marble hand. He pointed and said, the mommy and her dead boy. I said, yes, but Jesus was a man when he died. Later, we left the grounds, and as we drove away, I said to Hudson, Hudson, tell me what you saw today. And with deep feeling and sadness in his little voice, he said, I saw the mommy and her dead little boy man. I had a great lump in my throat. As I was moved, as I realized that even the heart of this little two-year-old had realized there was an inexpressible attraction to the crucified Jesus. I thought of the words of Jesus. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Yes, it's even true for a little two-year-old. Today, in our mind's eye, we're going back again to that Last Supper table and we will celebrate salvation. The communion, using the elements of the bread and wine as a memorial of Jesus' death on the cross and of the sinless life that he lived. When we ingest the bread and the wine, we remind ourselves that Jesus died to redeem us from the penalty of death but he also offered us his transforming life to change us into his image as we walk with him daily. Communion reminds us of our need of forgiveness and Christ's offer of everlasting life. See, we, we need to be reminded from time to time because as humans we tend to forget what God has done for us. In Jesus... If Jesus' disciples, who were first-hand witnesses, needed to observe the communion, then we also need to remind, have a reminder that Christ gave his life for us to redeem us from the consequences of sin. Nearly every time that the Bible mentions the Lord's Supper, the term covenant is used. Jesus stated, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. You see, a covenant is a pledge. It's a guaranteed agreement based on trust. Covenants were arranged by mutual consent between two, party, two parties. In some translations, they're referred to as testaments. The word covenant literally means to cover. It's in the sense of providing shelter, protection, or maybe even financial support. If I cover a bill, I compensate for it. Now in legal terms, a covenant is similar to a contract or a treaty or a compact, say like the Mayflower Compact. It commits each other, each other to a reality. To make a covenant, is to establish a binding agreement. When Jesus makes a covenant, it is 100% dependable. You see, in the Old Testament, God spoke 
Whenever God spoke of the, the term covenant, he used the words, my covenant. See, God took responsibility to keep the promise to us of our salvation. Whether it was his covenant with Abraham, excuse me, Adam, which was his, uh, the promise of enmity be between the evil one and mankind, or the covenant of protection made with Noah, or the Abrahamic covenant promising that he would become the father of a chosen people, or the Mosaic covenant where he chose to preserve a special people as a nation. In all these covenants, God initiated the covenant. But in the case of the Mosaic covenant, the people blurted out that they would be responsible to keep it. And all the others, God made the promise to covenant with his people. He gave Israel a chance to prove their promise, and they failed miserably. The same is true for us today. How many times have you, when you felt the need to reform, or you realize God, does, God has done something special, you blurt out, I'll never disobey you again. I will do whatever you ask. And before you know it, we failed again. You see, it reminds me of the statement in the books of, book Steps to Christ where it says our promises are like ropes of sand. When God covenanted with us, he wasn't demanding that we keep something on our own. He was giving us the life that we would be able, through his power and strength, to keep that relationship with him. You see, in terms of biblical covenants, they were confirmed with a sacrifice. Noah and Abraham didn't go out and hire a lawyer or draft a covenant or sign a document. The parties took a lamb, they killed it, they put it on an altar, they cut it in pieces, and the blood covenant, blood sacrifice, sealed the covenant. You see, it is through sacrifice that we are forgiven. God doesn't ignore or overlook sin. It must be atoned for. God's designed law is, will be satisfied. Sin extracts a price, a recompense, because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. In Romans 6.23. You see, before barcodes and electronic checkout devices, every item in the store had a price tag on it. So we knew what the cost would be. Sin in God's eyes carries a clear price tag. Punishment. We can take the punishment or we can accept the substitute that's provided for us. That's what the lamb was all about. In the Old Testament, people would confess their sin over the head of the animal, and this animal would symbolically take their place. It was usually a lamb, sometimes other animals. But the one presenting the sacrifice offering was saying, in effect, what's about to happen to this animal is what deserves to happen to me. The place of sacrifice emphasized the truth that without the shedding of blood, there was no remission of sin. So the way of forgiveness through animal sacrifice anticipated and looked forward to the sacrifice of Christ upon the cross. Jeremiah made this prophetic de declaration the time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judas. I will put my law into their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. I will forgive their wickedness. I will remember their sin no more. That promise is for us today. Jeremiah presented a covenant that had not yet been cut. Centuries later, Jesus realized and declared, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It is a new covenant 
because God himself provided the sacrifice. Jesus ratified the terms with his own blood. See, the old covenant at Sinai had human promises that were faulty and impotent. It taught, taught a lesson. But the new covenant instituted by Jesus was far superior. Jesus gave each one of us the personal gift of his life, which he laid down. And then he gives us, now as we live on, the power to live through the life that he lived. And that gift came, comes to us through the Holy Spirit. He said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is for your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. That Helper is the Holy Spirit. He brings Jesus' presence into each of our hearts as we invite him into our lives. In Romans 8, 8 and 9, it says, Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. So Jesus, the Holy Spirit, becomes the connection between us and God as he gives his, the very person and his very presence into our lives that his power might enable us to live the life of Christ. 1 John 3.24 says, And by this we know that he, Jesus, abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. And Galatians 3.14, That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So it is by trusting in the gift and receiving it that we are enabled to live a new life in Christ. Ephesians 3, 16, 17, and 19 says that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, that you may be fulfilled with the fullness of God. So, by the person, the presence, and the power of the Holy Spirit, we have an indwelling of Jesus Christ that is giving us life to redeem us and to reform us. When Jesus said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, he was giving us two illustrations about what blood would mean to us. You see, it is the shedding of blood that takes away life. And Jesus shed his blood that we might have eternal life. But the second thing that blood does is that it restores, it comes in in the human body, it comes in and restores every single cell with life-giving energy, whether it's the water, the chemicals, or the, the, the food that is, comes to every cell, and then it takes away the waste. So Jesus is saying to us, his blood is cleansing for us. He changes us when we trust him to do the job. In the Bible, when two people sealed an agreement or a contract, they would sit down together and share a meal. There's something about eating together that binds people. So today, when we take this cup and this bread, we show that we accept the terms of the new covenant. We accept the very life and death of Jesus Christ. There are terms. We're sinners and we're guilty before God. We deserve the punishment, but Christ is our substitute, and he took on the punishment, and his blood was shed upon the cross. And if we accept this sacrifice, then his blood covers our sin. We've been forgiven on the basis of Christ's sacrifice. But then... God every day keeps writing his law of selfless love 
on our hearts and in our minds enables us to live for him. So today, I invite you to partake of the table with these two wonderful remembrances that Jesus atoned, Jesus redeemed us, Jesus is also restoring us into his image. Make that a reality every day of your life. May God bless you as we partake in the ceremony. Let's sing hymn number 412, covered with his life, verses 1 and 4. Pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes. our heads. Father in heaven, we come to you this morning uh, thankful, grateful for your grace, the grace that uh, we receive and uh, that uh, um, bears out in our life humility that allows us to be of service to others. And as we take this bread and this wine, symbols of your body and your blood, that uh, 
uh, the life that you gave to us and that inspires us uh, towards service to others. As, uh, we imbi as we abide in you, we live and die and rise again with you. And in you, we live and move and have our being. We ask that you bless these symbols and uh, this service and uh, our service to the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
as you take these symbols, accept the life of Christ in you. Jesus said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. In the same manner, he took the cup. He says, this is a covenant in my blood. The scripture tells us that they sang a hymn and went out. So today, let's, as we sit together, sing the hymn, number 300, Rock of Ages. And on the way out at the door, the deacons will be gathering, gathering an offering for the poor. May we share what we have with others. Receive the blessing of the Lord. May the glory, grace of the Lord Jesus Christ fill you now and take you forth from this place filled with his love and joy to share with others the grace that he has given you. In Jesus' name, amen.